in one giant voice of praise, would you lift up your hands and give the Lord glory and honor and thanksgiving and praise in this house. Would you just begin to whisper his name? Jesus, to break every chain. Oh, As I stepped into the altar and we begin to pray with folks, the Lord spoke two words into my spirit. One of them, we were kind of singing a few moments ago, but the Lord, somebody thinks that's just a song, but the Lord wanted me to remind someone that this is a word from the Lord for you. And if our God be for me, hey. who can be against me? I said, if God be for me, who can be against me? And then the Lord spoke a second word. He said, you tell them no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Hallelujah. No weapon formed against you. No scheme or tactic or trap the devil has set. No disease that has touched your body. It shall not prosper. Give the Lord praise in this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Reach over and just make a connection with someone standing right there. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer before we go any further. The power of the, pre the presence of the Holy Spirit is here in this house. If you have any kind of feeler at all, you know that. The power of the Holy Spirit is here. Jesus who said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He's here in this house right now. Give him honor. Give him sacred reverence. Give him praise and glory. He's worthy. I said he's worthy. As you're making that connection right now as the body of Christ, I want you to give honor to the power of the Lord at work in the life of those standing with you. Right now, you're going to be a connection from the Spirit of God to pray for that brother or that sister. I want you in the anointing of the Spirit to pray for each other right now. The body of Christ begins right now. In the name of Jesus, Father, we ask you to heal bodies that are sick. I pray that you'll bring restoration to marriages that need healed. I pray, Lord, you'll touch where financial bondage needs to be broken. I pray in the name of Jesus, you will absolutely move every mountain, touch every heart, and break every chain in this house. In the name of Jesus, a brother or a sister who is completely encumbered by addiction, I break it in the name of Jesus Christ and give you honor and give you praise. And we thank you and we lift you up, Lord, for it's not in the name of a preacher. It's not in the name of the singers. It's not in the name of the church. It's in the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. It's at the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody together said, amen, amen and amen. Give the Lord praise and give him honor. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, it's good to be in church. I said it's good to be in church. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, hang on to your hat. If you got one. All right, you can be seated. Thank you. Wow. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
Well, if you didn't know it when you came in, may I inform you, you are in a full gospel spirit-filled church. We believe, we believe in the words of Paul when he was writing up, Paul didn't write that, Luke did, in Acts where he said, but ye shall receive power. I said, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. How many baptized Holy Ghost filled Christians do we have here in the house this morning? According to what I know and read in the Word of God, anything is possible in an atmosphere like this. Is it any wonder that we're in revival? Wow. Can I tell you that this atmosphere right here, this is what birthed the church. This is what set the church on fire. And here we are over 2,000 years later. And the Spirit of God is as strong. He's as powerful. He's as charged in the atmosphere as he ever was. And Jesus said, I'm going to go away. Send the comforter to you. And he made reference to the fact, he said, I'm going to go so that greater things then you've seen me do here greater things will you do. God is surely here in the house this morning. Amen. Elaine, no weapon. Come on. Uh, I'm not supposed to preach, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> We're so delighted to have with us today. You know, it's not always um, that you give a, a you know, a, amazing, awesome introduction to a pastor who's coming to preach. Sometimes you can say a few words and thank him for being there, but I want to tell you, and I've never really been able to say it publicly. I've talked about them, but I haven't really said this to his face. I don't think, well, maybe I've written it in letters. But I want to thank Lane and Judy Sargent. I was an 18-year-old kid stepped in the back door and sat on the back pew at Harlem Park and listened to this man preach. It changed my whole life. I wanted what he had. He taught me how to pray. I can take you to the place you prayed in the old Harlem Park sanctuary. I can, I can see you over there in the corner. And I would sit there, and I was in a prayer meeting with you, but I got to confess, I was just listening to you. You taught me how to pray. You taught me how to preach. When I started preaching, I said, Lord, let me preach like my spiritual father. I'm still working on it. You took me in. My daddy wasn't politically connected to the church of God. I didn't have any money. I didn't pay much tithe. I worked at a retail toy department store. I didn't have much to offer, but you both took me in as a son. You saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And seemingly nobody else around me saw. But you saw something. And for eight years, you poured into me as my pastor, as my spiritual father. And you have stayed with me all through these years. You have been my friend. When others would make life a little harder for me, you were the guy that was calling me on the phone saying, what's going on? I was praying for you this morning. The Lord has burdened me for you. What's going on? And I spill my gut. There's a lot of big name evangelists and a lot of guys and ladies that will come through like a wind. They'll sell you their CDs and all their DVDs, and, and there's very, there's good, there's plenty of good out there, good people that God's called to worldwide ministry. So I'm not being negative. I'm just saying that in these last days, how many of you know it's right to be very sure about who steps into this pulpit? The greatest compliment that I can give you is the 
said, I trust you. I trust you. He's already spoke to the 830 crowd and blessed me. I've already been to church. But he's here, and Sister Sergeant is here to pray, to love us for the next several days. Be here tonight, be Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We'll be in revival. I sure hope you'll come. I don't doubt that you will. The Lord has blessed them and honored them to be able to share and to travel around the country. And they preach, but what I always love is that they're always a little special on their calendar when they when they put us down. They love us as much as we love them. That I want to thank them for ministry. We thank them for their love, for their support, and I, I guarantee you, God used me. As a scared kid, I walked into his office at 20 years old, and I sat down, and I looked across his desk, and I made an appointment, and I said, Brother Sergeant, I, I uh, well, I, I feel like, I think, um, I, I might be called to ministry. And he looked across the table at me at his desk, and I, he smiled, and he said, it's about time. <laughs> he spoke words I would never forget. He said, the Lord told me six months ago you were called to ministry and that I was to wait until you came to me and that I would be the one to confirm it in your life. I never have forgotten that meeting or that day. And when I thought he had the greatest job in the whole world, I never would have guessed that God was going to give me his job. <laughs> But they're not only special to me, both of them, but they're special to you, those of you who know them. And if you don't, then, like I said, hang on to your hat, because you're going to love revival. Because he doesn't come to preach you a message that will cause you to just think about how spiritual and theological he is not going to come here and put on a show for you. He's coming to bring a message and to bring ministry to the body. So that's probably one of the better introductions I could give anybody. So thank you and he'll be coming in just a few moments but this is your opportunity to bless the missionaries that have come to us today. I want to give you the opportunity to give and as you give the ushers are coming. Many of you have come, have come prepared and ready to pay your tithe to your local church. I thank you for that. I thank you for those who are pledged, who have pledged and have been giving faithfully to our building program. Thank you to those. I had a, someone who came to me and said, I paid my pledge off, but Pastor, I've decided to continue my pledge. And I, I thank you for that. I have, I'm doing the same thing. I want to thank you that you are faithful in giving. Yesterday, we ran a four-hour marathon on Facebook for a little Hannah Rock who needed her budget raised for, for her therapy in Columbus. And I thought it would take all day. I called it an all-day challenge, and it started with one little gift. And from there, we raised over $1,700 in four hours. <laughs> And it just keeps growing. Every time I go check it, there's more. So I'm thankful for what God is doing through you. You're faithful and you're givers. You don't just give monetarily. You give of your heart and you give of your time. And I appreciate that today. But let's bless the couple that's come to be with us. I would like you to be able to officially welcome them into the service. But Mrs. Sargent, would you stand? And let's give them an official Stratford Heights welcome. We love you. Amen. When you come here, you not only come home, but you're, you're loved. Amen. Father, we ask your blessings on our gifts today. We thank you for the opportunity that we have the blessing that comes to our life to be able to make sacrifice and to just give. I pray that you will bless every heart and every life who's here 
who has been challenged in their own hearts to be a part. I pray in the name of Jesus you would bless them, touch them, provide for them. And Lord, let the work of the ministry be blessed and let your work here in Middletown continue as we dedicate ourselves to this revival season. Lord, knowing that you are constantly at work, we give ourselves, surrender ourselves completely to what you would speak to us through this season and ask that it will enable us effectively and efficiently to do more for your kingdom than we ever dreamed was possible. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Come on, get in praise in the house. It's not about you, it's not about me, it's about him. Anytime we sing or refer to Amazing Grace, it is our national, international, universal anthem. We do it out of respect and honor to the Lord of glory. I have some people in the house that know how to praise him, do I? Come on. Wow. Anytime God shows up like he is today, all I can say is, wow. It is amazing. Everything he does is amazing. Everything he has is amazing. Anything he is a part of is amazing. We don't have any words to describe him because any word that describes him falls short right on the face of the earth. We don't have any way that we can think about him, but we honor him as the Lord of glory with all power, all authority. He is the Lord. He is the Almighty. He is Jehovah. He is God. Now, I'll preach a little bit. And we'll do whatever. All I'm telling you is I expect every one of you tonight Tonight is no excuse night. Your pew will be rare. Wait, it will not leave. It will be situated in the same spot. And the only reason you won't receive from God tonight is because that spot will be empty. Oh, I know what I'm saying. I've pastored long enough to know that sometimes Sunday nights get slim. So much going on. But what greater encounter can you have today than to have an encounter with him? Does anybody in this house know without a doubt you're living under the favor of God? Then if you're living under the favor of God, favor is given to you to give away. Favor is not given to you for you to boast. Favor is given to you to give away. You know what happens if you don't give it away? You get to be one of those irritable church members. Oh, it's good not to pastor. I can say whatever I want to say and leave it. If I were still your pastor, I couldn't say some of these things because I knew somebody would be in my office on Monday morning. So in the morning, if you come to the office and Brother Ray is not there, he'll be with me. Talk to the associates. Find somebody else. If you want to complain, he's not the complaint department. I'm just going to help him a little bit, okay? Sometimes it wouldn't hurt to pick up the phone and call the pastor and say, Pastor, I love you. Bye. Hey, Amen. I'm preaching and you're not helping me now. He was talking about me and my ministry, and I really wanted to go to the furthest point back and hide. Because God has used me, and I didn't know it. That's the best way to be used of God. Ray Phillips is my spiritual son, and he tells me that this week I'm going to get to meet another one of my grandsons that came up under you, and then uh, yesterday I was texting to one of my grandsons, Brian Hunter, who is in moving back to Tallahassee, Florida. They're all related to me, and I get to be the spiritual father. I'll never be a spiritual grandfather. I'm not going to go that far. I love you. So, thank you for allowing me to pour into you. Thank you. You love your pastor, let him know. Tell him.
see, that's what makes a church great, is love and connections and walking together and trusting the man of God. The reason he allows me in the pulpit is he knows me. But I was the same way because the Lord spoke to me and he said, you are the guardian of the anointing. It don't take but one nut to mess it up. <laughs> Hello. Don't look at your neighbor. They're not the one. That wasn't your opportunity to do that. I believe God has prepared the way for this to be a memorial few days. I didn't come to bring revival. I didn't come to stir up revival. I came to be a part of it. Because you're already in it. It's already going on. I said it's already going on. And that's right. Somebody asked me, how come you yell? I said, because they don't listen. I yelled at my kids. Well, not a whole lot. Well, maybe I did. I better not go there. Peggy, it's good to see you. You were such a help to Judy Sargent, Judy Wilson back then, Tremont Avenue Church. Used to sit together. I don't know how you did it. I mean, you know, she still acts up. So, you know, if you see her acting up, would you move over here? If, if y'all see her get up and come and sit beside Judy, you know Judy's been acting up, okay? No. Thank you. Thank you for loving her, for investing in her, and being a part of her life in probably one of the most difficult times she's ever been through. Thank you. So this was back at the Tremont Avenue Church. In fact, I'm going back in August. I've been there about three or four times, going back again in August to be with them there. I, I'm just fellowshipping and allowing you who don't know me to feel this spirit that's in me. I came today to give it away. Anybody want what God's doing? Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Romans chapter 4. Let's see, family members are here. Here's a family member over here. Is any other family members here? How many, how many is here with you? Your family. There's family there. Debbie's here too. She used to speak to me. How come you don't? Oh, that's right. You got married. You got family. I haven't seen you since all that happened to you, have I? I'm embarrassed on her, and it feels so good. I love that. Love this family. They're all my children, spiritual children. They gave, they gave me the greatest honor is to be a part of their mother's funeral. No honor can be greater than to be a participant in somebody's mother's funeral. Love you guys. So good to see all the folks that I know. If I shake your hand and don't remember your name, just remember I get introduced and you don't. People will say to me, ah, you don't remember me. I say, well, I do, but I don't know your name. So that means I don't remember, okay? It's not that I have a problem with memory. I have a problem with recall. <laughs> that sounds a whole lot better. <laughs> Romans chapter 4, verse 17. You got to repeat this with me before I read it. Say, get your hopes up. <laughs> say it again, get your hopes up. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, get your hopes up. Quit being down in the mouth. Quit being a, a person who's negative. Quit just walking around in doom and gloom. You want to sing that song? What is it? Doom and gloom and agony on me? No. Say it again. Get your hopes up. Look with me at verse 17 as we talk about getting your hopes up. Verse 17, it says, And it is written, I have made you a father, talking about Abraham, of many nations, in the presence of him who believe. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Woo! I can't even pass that one up, folks. He calls those things that do not exist. Woo! That's maybe as far as I get with you this morning. You're going to have to come back for page two tonight. He calls, speaks, says, to something that does not exist and once he speaks the living word it comes into being no ifs ands and buts about it no doubts about it when he says it it's done he said who is he he's the one that can speak to dead and they 
speak it up. He's the one that speaks his word in the beginning. And John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and there was not anything that was made that was made without him. Who is he? He's the living word. Who is he? He speaks the things that do not exist, and all of a sudden they come into being. When he began to speak in the blackness of nothing, when things began to happen in the creation, there was nothing. But every time he spoke, something happened. I wonder how he said it when he said world. And the earth went whoop. I remember a man years ago, Peggy, that used to preach about this, and he'd say the Lord looked over on the side of the mountain and said, trees, please. His name was G.W. Lane. See, when God says it, do I have any people in here this morning that have a word from God? Let me see your hand. Then nothing can stop it. Nothing. I need to tell you what I told a couple in the altar this morning. Don't get delay and denial mixed up. Just because it's been delayed does not mean it's not coming. He doesn't work on your time schedule. He doesn't have an alarm clock. He doesn't have a calendar, but his time is always right. And every time it works according to the way he wants it to work, it works out the way he wants it to work. And he does it exactly like he told you he would do it. Because he's God, and he's at work, and you don't even know it. I don't know if I'm going to get there. I ain't going to worry about it. My Lord, I feel the anointing in this house. When you go back to the book of Genesis, do you realize... That God's day starts at night. Go back and read the book of Genesis. It says there was the night, then the day. Night, and then the day. So if you're in the darkness, you're already in his day. Then you better help me. That's, you, that's getting so good. I don't see how you stand it. Oh, I don't know. I can't see my way. He's there. He took it, and it says there was night. Day, and that was the first day. We look at it backwards. But God, oh, in Acts chapter 16, let me go there just in my mind, just a minute, just let me show you something. When Paul and Silas, you know, were put in jail and they were been beaten, they were put in stocks and chains, and they were there in their backs bloody, and they began to sing. You all know the story. But that's not what I want to tell you. While they were there in the darkest part they could be, there was no light. They didn't know if it was daylight or dark. They didn't know what time it was because it was totally pitch black where they were at. But the scripture says, while they were singing at midnight. Say midnight. <laughs> Do you realize that midnight only lasts one second? At one second past midnight, it was morning. Now, if you were preaching this good, I'd be helping you. <laughs> Midnight is just a transition. It's not a place to live. Midnight is when you're passing from one place into another. Midnight means that you're just waiting for the morning. And my Bible tells me I may be weeping and, and whoo. I may be weeping during the night, but when it goes one second past midnight, it is in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. Woo! Quit getting upset about midnight. It don't last long. Midnight is a transition. Where I live, we've got a fence around our backyard because I thought the Lord blessed me with a swimming pool, but he didn't. He blessed me with a job. <laughs> you understand where I'm at. But there is a gate that has a latch on it. And when the guy comes to do something to the pool, the first thing I have to do is go through my house, into my yard, and lift up the latch. Then he can get it in to my backyard. Can I tell you something? I know the one who controls the latch. I know the one that when I say, Lord, I want to make a transition, he says, okay, son, I'll flip up the latch. And what happens is when the door opens, 
for you to get from my front yard to my backyard, you've got to make a transition into the backyard. No longer are you in the front. I don't know where you are now, but he said to tell you the gate is open. It's time for you to make a transition into where he wants you to go if you're going to get what he has for you. I told those people in the early service they need to stay around because this lady, there's nothing close to where I was headed this morning. Somebody needs to make a transition. For I have provided for you things you have not yet seen. You are dreaming, you are envisioning, but you cannot comprehend what I have prepared for you. What I have instituted years ago is now falling into place. And if you will lift up your head and look, you will see that the things that I have prepared for you are coming toward you. They're not waiting on you. They're moving toward you. And if you will make the transition and do not be afraid, do not look around, but walk into the place where I am leading you, then I will open up before you things that you have never seen before. Your heart has never seen it. Your ear has never heard it. Your mouth has never spoken it. But I have prepared for you something that nobody can describe. Arise, my child. Leave and go to where I'm telling you, and you shall see the beauty of what I have prepared. I wish I had some praisers in the house. I said, I wish I had some praisers in the house. He won't let me leave the word transition because once you transition, you will experience transformation. See, he's not in the business today to make you feel better. He's in the business of transforming you. What does that mean? That means you won't ever be the same. I'm not much into these transformers, but I, the things I begin to see is once they transform, they don't look like anything they were. Say transformation. Transformation means you are not the same. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. You say, what are you doing now? I don't have a clue. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm so glad to be at the point in my life where I can say, I don't know what I'm doing. And the Lord said, that's where I want you, son. I want you where you don't know what you're doing. Because if I get you where you don't know what you're doing, then I got you where I want you, then you'll depend on me. And when you depend on me, things begin to happen. See, it doesn't matter if you remember who I am or what I say or whether I was a great preacher or not. I want you to remember him. Because once you come in an encounter with him, you can't stay the same. He's taking me back, and please come back tonight for page two, and I'll probably tell you to come back Monday night, or whatever page. But he's taking me back where a little bit I was this morning. It's in John chapter five, where there's a pool of Bethesda. Oh God, somebody needs this. Ricky, can I say something to you? There's such an anointing in this house. If you want to interrupt my preaching and run up here to this altar, do it. You won't bother me. I'll shout with you. Listen. It's a place that Judy reminded me after the first service that it has five porches. Five porches are where they brought the lame, the blind, the diseased, whoever, and they waited for the pool to be stirred by the angel. Anybody remember the Bible story? Here's what the Lord told me to say to us today. 
Quit making the church a pool of Bethesda because if you will realize it, the river of God flows everywhere you go. You don't have to wait till you're in here. I, I, I believe it. I believe somebody's going to be healed today. I was preaching up here in Ohio about a month ago, and a guy was watching me online. And while he was watching me online, he drove an hour. When he drove an hour, he had uh, Parkinson's. And he came in with his walker, and he said, I want to get to the altar. And if church was over, he parked his walker and walked across the front. It wasn't me. It's expectation, folks. What are you expecting him to do today? Have you been brought to the pool of Bethesda? Do you want to watch the angels stir the waters and just say, look at that, wasn't that good? Or do you want to get in? Do you want to jump in? As I told him this morning, here's a man for 38 years is lame, and he was brought, say brought, to the pool of Bethesda. And every time for 38, can you imagine? Let me put this in perspective. For 38 years, he came once a year. And every year, there he was. And for 37 of those years, nothing happened. I don't know about you, but I'm not about to go to a church where nothing happens. I've had enough cute church. Hello. I don't care what your hairstyle is. I don't care what your new dress looks like. All I care about is an encounter with him. I don't want to come and gather around the pool and watch you get blessed and you get healed. I want to be healed. I want to be blessed. I want to be helped. I want to be one that's there. But I've never said this before, but I shared it this morning. When the man brought him to the pool of Bethesda, they're all waiting. I guess they're looking toward heaven. And I guess somebody would say, have y'all seen the angel? What angel? The one that troubles the water. If y'all will come, he comes once a year. And he troubles the water, and when he does, if you get in, you get healed. Nah, I don't want that kind. I want the kind, if everybody here today wants to jump in, you can jump in. Woo! Oh, me, 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 me. I ain't preaching, I'm just talking right now. But look at this. He's there, and the angel is there, and Jesus walks out. And he's laying there on his mat. And Jesus, the healer, the deliverer, the answer for what he needs, asked him a question. He said, do you want to be made whole? Say whole. whole. He didn't ask you if you want to be healed. He said, you want to be made whole. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But when he looked at him, he's looking at the deliverer, the answer, his only way out. And when he asked him that question, he said, I don't have anybody to help me. Can I say something? When you got Jesus, you don't need anybody to help you. Don't be waiting on somebody else. Get in. Here's the question that the Lord told me to ask you again that I asked this morning. Never have asked this to a church before. Did you ever, do you ever stop to think, where is the man who brought him and laid him down? Why didn't that man stay and help throw him in? Thought. Hello? Well, why didn't he say, hang around? Say, you know what? I'm here. I brought you here, and I ain't going to leave. I'm going to stay around, and, and as soon as that angel shows up, I'm going to push you in. You be, be careful. That person sitting beside you may be the one that's going to do that. Just push you in today. <laughs> Look at this. Do you want to be made whole? He said, I don't have anybody to help me. I don't want anybody to be around me in a restaurant, out in a place of business, anywhere I get my gas, wherever I go, and say, I don't have anybody to help me. Because I have the one who can help, and his name is Jesus, and he's always there with me. When will the church understand that church is not the building, it's the people who get out there and begin to share what God can do? I wish I could tell you I learned this years ago, but I didn't. I've learned it since I left my church in Summerdale. Judy and I have prayer cloths, and we give them away everywhere. She's better at it than I am. Because Judy's never been a stranger. I've always been a little backward, okay? 
I know you can't tell that, but I have. Did you have a prayer call? And people said, you remember? What happened? I got healed. Folks, it's not rocket science. It's just simple that he will heal and help anybody. Even that person sitting beside you that you were fussing with in the car on the way here. Even those kids you got ready this morning, and they were unready by the time you got ready. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. You ever wonder why Sunday mornings are the hardest time to get ready? You get up in the morning, get ready for work, and nothing happens. You get up and get ready for church, and everything falls apart. You know why? Because you're the carrier of the anointing. I might as well preach a little strip here, okay? How many believe you're the carrier of the anointing? If you're the carrier of the anointing, the one thing the enemy doesn't want to happen today is for you to get together with somebody sitting beside you who carries the anointing. Because if you get everybody together that carries the anointing, in the Old Testament, it was the priesthood who carried the anointing. They put it up on their shoulders, and it represented the presence of God. Do you imagine what's going to happen in this house today when all of you who are the carriers of the anointing, and we all get in here together, and we begin to worship, and we begin to change the atmosphere because the corporate anointing makes an electric atmosphere where God can do anything? Turn to your neighbor and say, it's two minutes to 12. So they won't have to do this. I'm just keeping them from having to. You ever be in church and try to sneak a look? You ever done it? I have, and when I got through, he's looking right at me. I said, oh, Lord. So I'm watching you. He said, do you want to be made whole? The word whole has a connotation to it in Greek. That means to be totally Hello. Folks, can we get to the point where we can say, Lord, I don't, I don't just want my ailment healed. I want my life changed. Because I'm ready to make a commitment. Say commitment. Ooh, that's a hard word, isn't it? You know, it's, it's like the pig and the chicken walking down the road. This Alabama, so you have to understand, they, they do walk down the road in Alabama. Uh, we don't have electricity yet, but we're trying to get it. <laughs> we're working on it. This pig and chicken were walking down the road, and they talked to each other, okay? And the pig looks at this man's laying there, and he's dying. He's just up at the point of death. The chicken looks at the pig and says, you know what? Why don't we make him some ham and eggs? He said, huh, all right for you. That's just a donation, but for me, it's total commitment. <laughs> Hello? I don't want to just make a donation. Ain't nothing to lay in an egg. Guess what? When a chicken lays an egg, it's the most noise they ever make. I know I'm bringing some things back to you you've forgotten. Hello, commitment. He said, do you want to be made whole? And the man looked up at him. Jesus went over and got a bottle of anointing on him. Got an envelope for him. Offering, walked over to him, said, if, if you want to be made whole, if you'll give an offering to Jesus' son ministries, hello, ooh, you love me? Y'all said you did while I got, listen, I'm tired of people merchandising the anointing. He will do it for you if you don't give one dime. It's not, it's not principled upon what you do or who you are or what you give or where you live. It's upon the whoo, grace of the Almighty God. Amen. Am I doing okay? I don't know why I asked you. I'm going to keep doing it, okay? See, he didn't ask him for anything. But he said to him, you want to be made whole? He doesn't say, but evidently he said, yes. He said, then take up your bed and walk. In other words, nobody's going to help you because they don't need to. Now, this man's been lame for 38 years. Say 38 years. 
His muscles don't work. He has no strength. But one touch from Jesus. <laughs> he didn't lay hands on him. He just said, get up. Say, get up. Yeah. See, he didn't, he didn't make any premise on it. He not only told him to get up, he said, carry your own bed. <laughs> you don't just get up, carry what was carrying you. Hey, let me tell you something. Somebody's going to leave here today, and they're going to carry what carried them. Oh, you didn't get that. It's time for you to pick it up, lay it aside, get up, and take it with you, and go throw it in the garbage dump and say, I don't need it anymore because I have met Jesus, and I'm making a commitment, and I shall be made whole. Does anybody believe me? Say amen. Oh. I'm not going to land this plane, so don't get nervous. I am circling the field, but I can't get it to come down. Go back to where I started. He speaks to things that are not as though they were. Think about it. You got to hear that statement. Things that are not. The word not means no intelligence. It has no power. It has nothing. But when he speaks, he says, I think I'll just get up. Because he's the same one that stood at the tomb of Lazarus and said, get up. Aren't you glad he called him by name? Now look at this. This man's been dead four days. In fact, his sister said he stinks. I don't know. I guess after four days, maybe you do. I don't know. Here's what I want to show you. Something killed Lazarus. He didn't just die. He died with something that killed him. Are you with me? When Jesus spoke into the caverns of did. And his voice got to Lazarus. He got up. He walked out. He left it behind. Here's my point. Whatever DNA that was in Lazarus that killed him was in the grave when he walked out and he left it behind and said, I'm not going back there anymore. You say, how do you know that works that way? I've seen a God heal cancer. I've seen a God heal heart disease. I've seen a God deliver. I've seen a God. But when you walk out, what's left is what kills you. It's over. Say it's over. Say it's over. I've got a running spirit, and I ain't got the energy to run. So I'll just yell. You know why I have to yell? Because some of you are nodding. Woo! I love to do that and watch somebody. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. I'm just me. Whoever it is that needs to walk out, Jesus is calling you by name. See, I don't know your name. But he said to tell you at this very moment, he is just the same one who stood at the tomb of Lazarus and called him by name and said, get up, and death lost its grip. Life came back into the body, and whatever killed him stayed in the grave. Would you stand with me in this house? Would you put your hands together and give some praise unto the Lord? Come on. Get up. Get up. It's time for you to wave bye-bye to whatever it is that had hindered your life, 
hindered your walk, hindered, are you still with me? I don't mean to scare you, but in the name of Jesus Christ, as they are just beginning to play, I want to see how serious you are. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care what's happened in your life. I don't care how difficult it's been. I don't care what you face. He said to tell you like he did to the man on the pallet, do you want to be made whole? Does anybody want to be made whole? Say, yeah. Then walk down here right now in the name of Jesus. Now, don't hesitate because you hesitate, you won't come. Oh, what if I go and I don't get healed? What if you stay back there and you don't get healed? Oh, in the name of Jesus. I can't believe I've gone two services and not take my coat off. What I can see, daughter, what I see, daughter, y'all shot to sit in here. Come on, come on, come on. Elders, pastors that are here, whoever, come on, come in here with these. I know some are already here. Now let me give you some instruction. God gives me a word for you, I give it to you. I had a man at Jensen Franklin's church want me to give him a word and I didn't have one. He got mad and left. That's fine. I'm not going to make up something for you. If I give you a word and it doesn't happen, that means I made a mistake because I'm human. But if I give you a word like I did to the young lady over here a moment ago and she began to break and cry, that means God's doing something. See, I don't know you, but he does. And it's time to leave the grave clothes and the grave behind and whatever it was that got you to where you're at, anybody want to leave it behind? Say bye-bye. Bless the God. I said, am I non according to the Micaiah? Oh my Lord, oh my Lord. All right, I want you to look at me. I'm going to ask you the same question, but I'm just representing Jesus. When I ask this question, I want to hear a rousing yes. Do you want to be made whole? There's a miracle in the house. Ooh. There's a miracle in the house. I got to ask it again. Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made whole? This is your day for your miracle from your God. I don't know if I'll get to everybody. I don't know if I need to get to everybody. But I know you got Pastor Ray and you got other men here and other people who are here to help. reminded me of something before I pray for you. Look at me. See, there's one thing I've learned late in my ministry. You can't stop the Holy Ghost. If the Holy Ghost stops, you make the choice. Amen? But I feel like she's in agreement with me. I need to stop right here and have you bow your head for just a second. Would you do it right now? Is there anybody here who has heard the ministry of the word and the singing and the worship in this house and you know you're not right with God and you need to be saved. Is there anybody in this house that needs to be saved in this house? Would you just lift your hand right where you are and say, Brother Sergeant, pray for me right now. I'm not going to come back to you unless the Holy Spirit leads me. Is anybody, 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 anywhere? I see a hand there. I see a hand there. I see a hand there. Come on. Anybody else? 
Anybody else? There you go. I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? My, 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 my. Holy Ghost is at work, folks. Holy Ghost is at work. I don't know if you know it. This is revival. Revival is the inrush of the Spirit on a body that threatens to become a corpse. That's what we're in. The breath of God is breathing. Anybody else? Anybody else? I don't want to. There you go. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Here's what I'm going to have you do. The altar's full. We're going to pray a sinner's prayer right where you are. Then I'm going to ask you to come to your pastor. And I want you to tell him. Everybody put your hand over your heart. Help. Pray this prayer with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I realize I need you. Please forgive me of all my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. For I believe your word, and your word says, if I believe in my heart and I confess it with my mouth, I shall be saved. Thank you, Lord, by your blood, through your grace, by your word, I am saved. Listen to me. Look at me. It said if you believe in your heart and what? How do you confess it with your mouth? You tell your pastor or one of the staff members or one of the elders. Do that before you leave. Do you hear me? Or tell your neighbor. Tell whoever's with you. Hey, I got saved. I got saved. I got saved. Isn't it wonderful? Give praise to the Lord, church. Hallelujah. And if you want to walk up here to me or my wife and confess it, that's all right. As long as you speak it with your mouth. Because if you don't, the enemy will steal it from you. Hello. Hello. Anybody ready to be healed? I said, anybody ready to be delivered? Well, let me see the workers. Raise your hand if you're a worker, altar worker, elder, or whatever. You're down here to help. All right. I want you, as I began to do it, you began to do it. If you feel like there's somebody who wants me to pray for them, not because I'm anything, but usually the evangelist, okay, I'm fine. I'll come over and pray for them. I don't care. We don't start again till 6. If we stay till 6, you know, bring me a burger or something. We'll hang around. Are you ready? Stretch your hands toward this altar right now. Let the spirit of the Lord Father, as we lay hands on them, we represent you. And as we represent you, we represent the God of everything. By your stripes, they are healed. Woo! By your stripes, they are healed. I speak your word over them. Nothing can be against them. You are their Lord. 